Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, welcome to the Asia Society Policy Institute webinar. Today, we're going to be focusing on the World Trade Organization. We're not going to focus on the WTO shortcomings and all of the challenges it's facing. Um, I, we'd like to take kind of a more pragmatic perspective today and really talk about um, what can be achieved this year. Um, late last year, um, as many of us know, um, the WTO was scheduled to hold a ministerial meeting. And many people viewed this as an action forcing event where log jams would be break, broken, negotiations would be unlocked and outcomes would be delivered. In short, it would help get the WTO back on track. Unfortunately, the ministerial was postponed and it's yet to be rescheduled. And it's kind of thrown a curveball at efforts to advance negotiations. But Director General Ngozi has been very clear in urging members not to, not to take a break and basically move quickly and boldly to move issues forward and make progress even without a ministerial meeting. So today we're gonna to explore the following questions, where does that leave the WTO and what are the prospects for making substantive progress and finishing outcomes in negotiations without a meeting of the ministers? There's a long list of issues, including fisheries subsidies, responses to the pandemic, non-market economy issues, agriculture, e-commerce, industrial subsidies, dispute settlement environment, and the list goes on and on. We have a great lineup of speakers today to address these questions and really offer their perspectives on what needs to be, what needs to get done, what can get done, what should get done, and how we go about doing it. And I'm honored to kick off the program today with Deputy Director General Angela Ellard of the WTO, and she'll be followed by a discussion by a group of panelists. Now, Angela, in many respects, particularly um, for the US audience, she really doesn't need an introduction. Anyone who's worked on trade has crossed her path and has been so impressed with her. She's probably one, if not the most respected and revered trade experts in Washington. And she joined the WTO last spring as one of the four deputy director generals. During her longtime career in Capitol Hill and the Ways and Means Committee, she drafted and built support for all major trade legislation and really doing it with what I would call grace, grit, and skill. <laughs> so welcome, Angela. We're thrilled to have you join us. Um, we're going to start with a conversation between us, but I would encourage our viewers to um, type in any questions into the Q&A box um, at the bottom of the screen, and we'll try to get to those as well. So, Angela, let's start. Um, we're now about two months from the scheduled WTO ministerial meeting. There have been a number of meetings in Geneva, and I understand the general counsel is going to hold the meeting or is holding a meeting as we speak. Um, what's your take on the state of play in Geneva? Is progress being made? And, and if so, on which issues? Well, first of all, Wendy, hello. Uh, great to see you. Um, and uh, such a kind, gracious introduction um, coming from someone uh, I admire so much uh, as well and the contributions that you've made to, to trade policy and that you continue to make in your, in your new role. Um, so thanks for having me here today. Um, so yes, the postponement of the uh, of the of the ministerial meeting in November was uh, was was really quite. It, it was very frustrating. We all hated to do it, but we knew we needed to do it, and it was one area where we actually got unanimity from our members about the need to to postpone. Clearly, the 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 Omicron uh, situation had just begun. Travel restrictions were in place um, and uh, it was impossible for many to travel to make it there. Um, so we had to postpone, but 
that doesn't mean the work has stopped. And in fact, we're doing everything possible to maintain the momentum um, and to increase the momentum and to get us to the point where ministers can make decisions. Um, but it it is uh, it's because of the pandemic, because of the um, the tremendous uncertainty created by the pandemic. It's no longer business as usual. I mean, it obviously hasn't been business as usual for the last two years. But I thought we had reached a point in late November where we were adapting to the new normal. We were ready to hold an in-person meeting, and then the bottom fell out. So um, I think that that the unpredictability of this pandemic is something that we have to keep in mind, um, both in terms of policy choices, but also in terms of the of the process of, of what we do, which, which brings us to the question that you raise, um, which is what's happening in Geneva? What's the mood? What is the, uh, the sense of, of, of what can happen? So as you know, yes, our general counsel is meeting right now. That is the highest uh, body of, uh, of WTO members, aside from when the ministers get together. And the purpose of the meeting today is to talk about that very topic, what are the next steps? But this isn't the first time we're having this discussion. Um, the head of our general counsel has been engaged in intensive consultations with members over the last several weeks. And in the meantime, on each of the different substance uh, subject matter areas, there's been intense discussion as well. Trying to figure out how to take what we have and how to build on it and how to uh, how, how to bring us to the stage of, of having agreements. Um, so we did, after um, MC12 was postponed, uh, progress continued to be made on, on issues relating to services, uh, for example, on domestic regulation, and that was concluded, so that was harvested. We've also made progress on issues relating to gender and on um, the environment as well, where some new initiatives have been launched. So that's all very positive, and that shows the continued momentum. In addition to that, we have work that's ongoing relating to the pandemic itself, um, two streams of work, one relating to intellectual property um, and uh, the, uh, the intellectual property treatment of vaccines, um, as well as other uh, elements such as um, diagnostics and therapeutics. Those are questions that many of our members have brought to the table. Um, we also have negotiations ongoing uh, with respect to intellectual property. Um, I, I'm sorry, with, with respect to um, the pandemic on what should be the trade response to the pandemic in addition to uh, intellectual property. And I could talk about all of these in more detail. We also have a stream of work relating to fish, fisheries subsidies. Um, where the, the chair of those negotiations has been engaged, again, in intensive consultation and will be calling for meetings of different configurations of, of members to try to sort through some of the remaining issues. On FISH, we had made tremendous progress here in Geneva um, with the help of uh, officials from capitals who had come to Geneva or who were participating virtually to get work done. We cleared up a lot of brackets in the text um, and had advanced that to the point where it went to ministers for their uh, work on um, uh, closing out the remaining brackets. We have other issues too uh, relating to agriculture, for example, which has been quite difficult um, and a text that has been circulated by that chair and continued consultations as well. So I can dig into the, any of these in, in more detail, but that kind of gives you a sense of what we've been working on here. Um, I think there is very strong momentum. I think there is a desire by our membership to, to try to accomplish as much as possible and to tee up issues to consider for reform, how to reform the organization um, through uh, various means in all three of its functions. Um, negotiations, monitoring, and dispute settlement. But I'll leave it at that, and then we can explore different issues in more detail. Okay, so maybe we can maybe start with fish subsidies. There's no easy issues here. Um, on fish, um, the negotiation now that I understand has probably been 
underway for about 20 years. Um, progress is being made. But I noted that when Ambassador Tai recently talked about these negotiations, she stressed the need for an, an ambitious outcome and not just kind of locking in the status quo. Um, can you comment on maybe her comments and maybe share with us what are the remaining sticking points? Is it, is it mostly about just locking in the status quo? And how um, significant is this kind of developing, developed country um, divide on this negotiation? Is this really holding up, um, you know, in, you know, the, the final outcome on this negotiation? Well, like you said, nothing is easy. Um, and when I started here in Geneva in June, um, the negotiations had been going on for 20 years. A lot of progress had been made. There was a text that, uh, that our uh, chair had, um, had put on the table to reflect the things that members had been telling him. Um, and then that text advanced. So more and more progress made, brackets removed, approaches um, determined in many key areas. So that, that was very good to see, culminating in, in, in the last text that he put on the table um, in November. And, and keep in mind that this text isn't his ideas about what the text should look like. It is a text that reflects what members have been saying. Um, and it's also the product of small group meetings um, in which uh, key, key members on particular issues would get together to try to hammer something out that then they would turn to sell to the broader membership, which has been a, a, a very constructive way uh, to, to, to go about uh, doing this. Um, so to your question about ambition, that's really the heart of this. Um, there, there really, I don't think, is much interest in, in merely um, codifying what exists now, maintaining the status quo and saying what you what you do right now today is good and you just can't go above it, but you can maintain what you're doing. So now. You, you can't become more restrictive. Right. The idea is to try to put some disciplines on this. And, and there's a very simple reason why. When these negotiations began 20 years ago, the level of overfished species was, you know, basically about 30%. Now, by some measures, it's over 50%. So the problem is getting worse. So maintaining the status quo isn't the solution. And this isn't just, yes, it's about the fish, of course, but it, it's got broader implications environmentally, economically. Uh, so many people depend, their livelihoods depend on fish, fishing, either um, in terms of eating it or um, uh, further you know, work done to it, manufacturing in the manufacturing sector. Um, and of course, the, the jobs that, that, are, um, uh, that we see because of, of fish. So this is a very, very important issue. Um, and it's got a lot of environmental implications as well. If, if we can't do this, it's not a good sign about uh, the WTO if members can't come together here. So the effort is to do something meaningful. What are the key issues you ask that, that remain? Um, yes, um, the, the question of how we deal with developing countries and so-called special and differential treatment, as we call it, um, for developing countries should they be treated the same? Should they, have, should they follow the same rules? Should they have more time? Should they uh, be given additional flexibilities? Those are all key questions. And in addition to that, should there be technical assistance and capacity building to help developing countries um, uh, to undertake the disciplines that are in the agreement. So all of these are very much at the, at the forefront. This is one of the biggest questions that uh, members are, are addressing in the context of the negotiations. Yeah, you know, there I've are heard, other issues yeah, as well. I've heard people refer to this negotiation kind of as the litmus test for the WTO, that if it fails here, then this really doesn't speak well for the organization. So it's so yes. important yeah, that progress be made. Um, exactly. I, you know, litmus test is is a is is a pretty tough phrase, 
Um, but I think that a lot of, of members, certainly um, observers, critics are looking at this to, to see. I mean, FISH has its own particular issues um, that are unique. So in a way, it is a sign whether we can resolve these issues. It's a sign as to whether members can do this in other areas, but it is unique at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe we can turn to the pandemic response. And as you said, okay. that members are working on the trade response to the pandemic. Well, the pandemic's been underway now for about two years, and the WTO just seems to be behind the curve on this and that countries have put in a lot of export restrictions and, and you know, other restrictions. And of course, there's a TRIPS waiver issue. Um, this seems to be a priority issue, um, but what's holding up just being able to, I understand the TRIPS waiver issue, maybe we'll, we'll take that separately, but in terms of a pandemic response, addressing kind of the trade facilitation, the export restriction, and the other aspects, what's holding up that work? Or is it all just um, tied up with the TRIPS waiver issue, which is so controversial? Yeah, well, the TRIPS waiver issue is controversial, but there is this other stream of work, which, which actually has been quite productive. Um, it, it's interesting to see, I mean, first of all, members had to understand what was, what was out there um, in, in terms of uh, what are the supply chain bottlenecks, uh, for example, what are the restrictions that um, governments uh, may put on the table. Those are, those are all things that had to be analyzed. So the WTO did a lot of work um, to uh, show what, um, what, what various policy uh, choices are out there, um, trying to figure out, uh, for example, what are the tariffs for all the products that are used to make vaccines? Um, that sounds easy, but it's not actually. It's dozens and dozens, hundreds of products. And if you break down those products further to their okay. components. And how many tariff lines, right? <laughs> and how many tariff lines, exactly. But that's very concrete information that governments can use then to decide, oh, I see, if I, if I keep a high tariff on this product, it's going to have this impact on me. Um, so uh, a lot of that work, I think, has been very useful, even if it's not something that the members had to actually, you know, agree on. It's not an agreement, um, but it's it's very important research work um, that aids policymakers. And we've done all kinds of things on supply bottlenecks, um, working within the WTO and with other international organizations as well, but also working with companies working with companies, with stakeholders to see what they see as the problems and, and trying to get everybody to talk to each other. That was, that's been a very big part of what we've done. And identifying things like export restrictions, um, that, that has been a big factor. And what we've seen is over the months, countries have adopted more trade facilitation measures um, and uh, I think some of them have started to have second thoughts about some of the barriers that, that have been imposed. Now, maybe a lot of it is just because the conditions changed and the initial shortages perhaps aren't as acute as they were. Um, but um, the, the fact is that we've seen some positive developments there. Now, we're trying to capture all this together in what we call the Walker process, Ambassador David Walker from uh, New Zealand, a former ambassador uh, from New Zealand now at this point, he retired last month. Um, but uh, he, his work to try to put together the elements of an, an understanding among members um, has been quite productive. But one of the, the beauties of this kind of work is that um, countries can, can work unilaterally uh, once they have information, they can operate unilaterally to reduce barriers because it's to their benefit. That's one of the advantages of trade facilitation, that you don't do it for others, you really do it for yourself. Um, and so we've seen a lot of progress uh, on, on that front. 
Interesting. Um, okay, let's turn to another topic. Um, just this past December, China, um, um, 20th anniversary of WTO accession occurred. Um, there's been a lot of discussion in Washington and in other capitals in the world um, regarding whether WTO rules really address the types of unique Chinese trade practices, which um, involve the state, increasingly involve more and more a role for the state sector. Um, specifically on the issue of industrial subsidies, um, is there any progress being made either with respect, and I know the U.S. had put a proposal with other countries on the table a couple of years ago about notification. Is there any progress being made on just, you know, working with other organizations to, to really bolster the, um, you know, the information base and any prospects for negotiation in, in this tricky area? Well, um, I would say here, there has been a lot of work. Um, and uh, in fact, we've been working very closely with the other key economic international organizations um, to assess um, the state of uh, subsidies and um, who's offering them, um, what do they look like, what kinds of effects do they have. Um, and this work is well advanced. Which organizations? So uh, we're working with the World Bank, with the OECD and the IMF, uh, as well as, of course, the WTO, really the WTO taking the lead uh, on this because the disciplines are within our, our jurisdiction. Um, so, the, you know, the first part of any discussion of subsidies has to be to figure out what they are, um, to, to do the research and get the information. Um, and uh, Simon, who's on the panel uh, next, I know has done a lot of work on this, to, uh, so de definitely um, appreciate that. Um, and we're doing our work internally and with these others, these other organizations to try to um, lay this out. Um, now, the WTO is a member-driven organization, so any effort then to, to take it to the next step to negotiate, uh, to decide whether to negotiate, what are the parameters for the negotiation? That is member driven. So the members need to decide that. But I think there's an understanding among members that the first step is to have the facts. Um, and there, you know, there are a lot of uh, uh, political dynamics about this. You mentioned, Wendy, the, the, the way you described it, uh, perhaps from a US perspective, focusing on subsidies by China. Other WTO members look at it in different ways. Um, certainly it can relate to the issue of non-market economies. It can also relate to the question of the pandemic and pandemic responses through stimulus. It can also relate to uh, issues relating to uh, tariffs and retaliation. So there's, there's a lot out there, I think, that, that has to be assessed um, and a lot of progress on this. But fundamentally, the next steps um, in, in taking this work and, and trying to figure out where we go next is, is up to the members. But I, I sense from a lot of those I've talked to some real interest um, from perhaps from different perspectives, not necessarily seeing eye to eye um, on what it is we're talking about, but, but definitely an interest in, in doing this. And as you mentioned a minute or two ago, I think for many, and I know that that uh, many in this audience uh, are U.S. based, um, the 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 question of of how to look at this is um, very very tightly wound to the question of WTO reform, as you point out. Yeah. yeah. Now, I mean, each of these issues has really they have their own complexity. Um, maybe we can move to um, um, another issue that's come up in the, in the Q&A box, um, one that you won't be surprised I'm going to raise, and that is the issue of dispute settlement. I mean, you probably know better than anyone, you know, Washington's concerns about the dispute settlement mechanism and what led, um, you know, USTR over time not to um, approve new appellate body judges. Um, but looking ahead um, in 2022, do you think there, there's any prospect for reviving um, and improving the dispute settlement mechanism? I do. I, and I think that progress is being made, um, maybe not as quickly 
as uh, some would want, but but there, I think there is more of a dialogue than there was in the past. Um, today, for example, we had a meeting of the dispute settlement body this morning, um, and there was an extensive discussion, as there is at every DSB meeting once a month, um, on this topic, uh, with many many countries speaking about the need to um, uh, to get this issue resolved. Um, and uh, I think, you know, it, it, you can look at this from a, a variety of perspectives. I think that um, the U.S., just to um, uh, frame what the U.S. has been saying uh, and what the U.S. said today, is that um, its position has been clear for many years across many administrations and that it uh, believes that um, the appellate body has gone beyond its mandate in so many ways, both procedurally and substantively, um, to uh, ill effect. Um, the position, I think, by many other members is that, uh, at first, an unwillingness to even talk about the issue. I think now there is more of a sense that there has been a problem, and it has become one of the, the key issues in, in, in terms of reform that is adopted. So we see the dialogue shifting now from saying, no, there is no problem to, yes, there, there has been a problem with the appellate body and let's figure out what the next steps are. Um, so I think that that's very good. I would say though, in the meantime, on dispute settlement, uh, as we saw in our DSB meeting today, um, WTO members continue to use the panel process, that phase of the process. Cases are still being brought. Um, we had a case uh, during uh, the last uh, dispute settlement body meeting on ripe olives uh, from Spain, um, in which the United States actually agreed to adopt the panel report instead of appealing it. And of course, because there is no appellate body, the action of appeal would have, as we say, uh, you appeal into the void and it means that nothing happens. Um, but the US has actually agreed to adopt that, that panel report. So that does move forward. We have other uh, efforts as well um, where parties are discussing between themselves um, particular disputes uh, after a panel or before a panel has started um, in, in an effort to uh, try to find a resolution calling on the good offices, for example, of the chair of the DSB or other key ambassadors to help uh, arbitrate uh, between them. So this is, th there are efforts underway to try to resolve disputes very creatively, I think. And that gives me a lot of hope for resolving this issue. I mean, that's good to know because yeah, people, people's impression is that, you know, everything's that it, that the whole dispute settlement mechanism is broken and, um, you know, the Geneva is no longer kind of a venue for resolving disputes. So thanks for, for that input. Um, we've got a number of questions on e-commerce negotiations, where I know the, the co-conveners keep talking about how progress is being made, um, which is heartening. On the other hand, um, the fact that there are no disciplines in the WTO on e-commerce, which is just, an, you know, an, such an important and growing part of trade, um, is a little disappointing. Um, do you think in 2022 we might see a successful conclusion of these negotiations? Or do you think the, the, the differences, particularly on data between China and the U.S., the U.S. and the EU, and, and between other parties is just going to prevent um, a successful outcome for these talks. Right, yeah. Well, I'd say um, establishing rules on digital trade um, is one of the key areas where the WTO needs to evolve to meet the times. Um, considering how much trade is conducted on digital platforms, considering um, uh, as well, the fact that during the pandemic, if anything, that's increased tremendously. Um, so these rules are very relevant. They are also relevant to questions like privacy and cross-border data flows um, and uh, localization of servers. All of these issues are, are very important in the context of this, 
um, of this negotiation. Now, I should point out, um, I know you know this, but, but others may not, that this negotiation in the context of the WTO is actually a plurilateral negotiation. So the, um, the nature of the negotiation is a bit different than our usual multilateral negotiation. So the, 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 the distinction is that we have kind of a coalition of the willing um, uh, who come together to, um, to negotiate this, but it really does involve a lot of the key players. Of course, the United States, also the EU, also China, um, many, many other countries, Singapore, Australia, Japan, who've been very strong leaders in this particular negotiation. Um, so um, I, I think that there is, um, because I guess I, the way I put it is that if you're participating in this negotiation, you've self-selected to be there. Um, so I think that is a good sign. Um, the issues are complex. Um, in the meantime, we're seeing our, some of our WTO members working bilaterally to try to um, find solutions that can be examples for uh, a larger agreement. Um, and then, you know, you would hope that you move from plurilateral at some point to um, uh, something that's more multilateral. But it does raise questions, um, too, that we hear from developing countries about the digital divide. And uh, we do have a work program on e-commerce that is um, intended to, to try to address the digital divide. Um, and there's you know, a healthy debate as to whether that divide exists or not uh, among our members that, that they often um, speak about. Um, there's also the question of the moratorium on, the, um, uh, on, on tariffs on uh, the transmission of e-commerce. Um, that moratorium is in place, but it expires at the end of uh, once the ministerial meeting is finished. So that's another discussion, another intense negotiation that's, that's been ongoing too. So we see this um, being played out in a variety of, of ways. Uh, right now, plurilateral in particular on, on the e-commerce negotiations. And I have to, I have to say, some, some of our developing country members believe that um, the WTO should not be in the business of conducting plurilateral negotiations. So that's been part of the debate too. Um, so it's, it's fascinating to see, uh, but this is just such a critical area. And I think so many of our members are, are really committed to getting it right. Yeah, I know there are webinars that, that just focus on the question of plurilaterals. Um, are they are they you know the, the the path forward? I for one think they are, and particularly they're needed if the WTO is going to remain relevant. Um, we're we're at our witching hour. I did want to ask you just one kind of softball question, um, and then we'll let you we'll let you leave. And that is like through the years, you know, um, you visited Geneva. You were involved in WTO work, you know, from, from the Hill. What has surprised you the most now that you're on the inside of the organization? And I want to put you on the spot. So um, any thoughts there? Um, yes, there, there've been a lot of, uh, there've been a lot of surprises, but, but then a lot of things that um, uh, I had predicted um, in terms of what I would see. Um, I would say that um, being a delegate is different. When you come to Geneva representing a government, in my case, representing a particular branch of government, Capitol Hill, um, you, you are an advocate for a particular uh, point of view. Um, being on this side, it's a bit different. Um, I'm, I'm supposed to try to help bring people together. Um, and uh, try to find solutions that aren't, aren't necessarily um, being pushed by one government or another, one member uh, or another. I, I would have to say that I knew a lot of the WTO staff before I came here, but didn't really work with them all that closely. The secretariat. Been, the secretariat. The secretariat, yeah. yes. Yeah. I've been remarkably impressed by how able and competent and skilled um, our secretariat is, and that has uh, that has been um, uh, that's been very nice to see. 
The last thing that I would say is that, of course, we're under new leadership with uh, the, the new director general, um, and she has brought a particular uh, brand of not just freshness, um, but, but really pushing everything in terms of saying just because something's been done before, if anything, that may be an argument uh, as to why not to do it, um, because things haven't worked in the past. And, and I think continually breaking the mold and forcing people to think outside, think outside the box is, you know, kind of a trite term, but, but she really has forced that discussion among members and among the staff in, within the secretariat. And that's been very healthy, um, I think. And uh, she started by acknowledging the need for reform. More than acknowledging it, she ran on it. That was her platform. Um, so I think that's been uh, very good to see. Um, and it's been, it's been the thing for me that, that's really changed between when I came here before um, so many times over so many years, going back so many directors general to, to now. Yeah, and I think one of one of the best decisions she made was bringing you on board. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I would That's also right. just say that, you know, you talk about your, um, you know, the new role you're playing, not as an advocate, but as someone trying to find common ground. I um, mean, you had those skills from Congress as well, where you had to build consensus and find common ground. So she couldn't be better serves. So Angela Ellard, thank, thank you so much for taking the time. This has been great. You've put a lot on the table. Um, we're gonna turn now to our next panel, but um, thanks again. And we hope to have you back at some point. Thank you. Thanks, great to see you. And thanks so much for this great discussion. Great, thank you. Thanks. Okay, with that now, we're going to turn to our panel of speakers. And we have um, a great panel. We'll be going now till 1015. And I would urge people to put questions um, in the, in the um, box below if you have any for, for the panelists. We have with us Simon Evanett. I, I believe that um, Angela already referred to him. He is the professor of international trade um, and economic development at the University of St. Gallen. He's coming to us from Geneva. He runs the Global Trade Alert, a group monitoring policies that impact global commerce, has done a lot of tracking of pandemic related responses from governments, and most recently has published a study on, on subsidies that we'll be, that we'll be discussing. Um, Yuko, Yuka Fugunaga, um, internationally recognized expert in economic international law at Waseda University in Tokyo. Um, she um, is an expert on all things WTO and trade, and we'll be asking her to share her views on a number of the issues that Angela mentioned. And finally, Sarah Stewart, um, now the executive director of Silverado Policy Accelerator. She, is the, she was the deputy assistant USTR for environment and natural resources um, and she's going to be sharing some of her views on, um, on the environment and climate agenda um, at the WTO. So with that, I'd like to kind of turn to each panelist to get um, things going and kind of ask for your responses, reactions to the points that Angela made. Now, she put a lot on the table. I think it's fair to say that she was you know, pretty optimistic about where things um, are headed in 2022. But um, she also mentioned a number of challenges. So maybe we can just do go to, I can turn to each of you and just ask you a few minutes, what, what stood out for you? What did you agree with? What did you disagree with? Or how would you characterize the state of play in the WTO and the prospects for um, tangible deliverables in 2022? Simon, over to you. I too um, am pretty optimistic, uh, at least I think at this start, part of the year, but you, any sensible assessment has to recognize that there's a possibility of some real serious down, downside scenarios. Imagine what would happen if the e-commerce moratorium on customs duties was not renewed. I mean, this would be, I think, a major step backwards. Um, and again, imagine what would happen if we can't conclude fisheries. Now, this really is I, you used the phrase litmus test. Um, I've been using that phrase in a similar way for this issue. It really is I stole it from you. 
uh, it's utterly embarrassing if we, if the WTO can't get there. No, if you want to be optimistic, I think maybe what we have to do is to start thinking about these issues. Uh, will the diplomats start thinking about these issues in more, how can I put it, separated uh, uh, boxes? I mean, the more that these issues bleed together, um, the more problems we have. So if you start thinking about the forced labor issue in fisheries as a litmus test for you know where WTO rules are going in the future on trade and development, then we when we get into trouble. So I think if the, the the thing to look for, I think, is whether ambassadors are taking these pieces bite by bite, uh, breaking them up and, and getting them done, or whether people are just grandstanding and, and making all sorts of unwarranted connections across topics. In some ways, just to follow up on that, that's a really different mindset than the mindset of, of rounds that have characterized the WTO and GATT for years and years. So now we're talking about kind of silos. Is, is, that, a, is that what you're saying, that we've moved on from rounds and we need to really think issues, you know, issue by issue? I think, I think I, let's just put it this way. If at the end of this year, we look back and say this was a good year for the WTO, it's probably because a lot of these issues have been dealt with one at a time uh, and not connected too much with one another. So think of it as separate tracks as opposed to rounds. Got it. Yuka, over to you. What 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 stood out for you in terms of what Angela said or didn't say? Thank you. First of all, thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction to this event. I'm very honored to be part of it. And since being, I'm from Japan, I'm going to speak from a Japanese perspective. And uh, from a Japanese perspective, the, the proper functioning of the WTO is, is, um, is critical. And for Japan, the WTO has been at the core of Japan's economic diplomacy. So from that point of view, um, the US engagement in the WTO is essential. And I think I'm kind of encouraged by uh, Deputy Director General's observation that there is some silver lining and especially in the context of dispute settlement, I, she, she says some positive development on, on that front. So um, I hope the uh, momentum will be um, maintained despite the postponement of MC12. And in terms of the um, continuing momentum, I'd like to mention maybe two, one or two issues. One is related, related to the substance. And um, I think there are many controversial contentious issues like the trips waiver issue, which uh, Deputy Director General mentioned. But there are also low hanging fruits. For example, I, I, maybe I shouldn't say low hanging, but there are more realistic, um, feasible subjects. For example, the e-commerce negotiations, perhaps they are participating members are making progress on the e-commerce talks. Perhaps I'll come back to this, this subject later. And also, um, and um, though in those negotiations, members are basically ambitious, but at some point in future, there are they, they have to be more flexible and inclusive to reach an agreement. So um, while it's important to be ambitious, but at the same time, there may be some point where members have to think about uh, being more inclusive and flexible. And the other point that, that I want to mention is the uncertainty that Director, Deputy Director General mentioned. And this pandemic that we are now going through will end at some point in the future, I hope so. But um, unfortunately, uncertainty will continue for a while and there will be another um, pandemic. So there will always be a risk that large gatherings like ministerial conferences may be canceled. And I think it's really um, sort of a surprising and um, I think it's uh, sort of a problematic uh, that members while talking about e-commerce, digital trade, but they're not exactly using those technologies to have negotiations, make decisions. And I think they have to be more um, innovative about how to, how to um, make negotiations, how to uh, make agreements and so on. So um, those are my points and I'll um, over to you. Thank you. Those are great. And we'll follow up in, in our conversation. Sarah, over to you. Are you optimistic or after listening to Angela, do you feel that maybe she was too positive and that, um, you know, there's some serious challenges on the horizon? 
Well, thanks, Wendy. And I think I would say, having worked very closely with Angela when I was at USTR and she was on Capitol Hill on a range of different negotiations, if she's involved, she's going to be pushing for an ambitious outcome. So that does give me a lot of comfort um, that, you know, when she talks about an optimism, um, that there's that there's a plan in place. Um, I was also really encouraged to hear her speaking about environment issues. This has been an area that has been basically the core of you know, my career over the last 15 years, in addition to broader trade issues. And you know, I can remember a time when trying to get trade and environment issues linked up was you know, seemingly impossible. Um, I think we've come a really long way there uh, to hear Angela talking about the fisheries subsidies negotiations as uh, an issue where a lot of progress has been made and where an ambitious outcome that goes beyond the status quo is necessary is really music to my ears. Um, it's an issue that I worked on very closely in TPP and with USMCA, I think that there's a real opportunity here for the WTO to show that a multilateral agreement that includes high ambition outcomes is possible. If it doesn't, I think that there's some, you know, cleaning up and some uh, a, a big rethink that's going to need to be done. Um, so I, I am positive, uh, you know, have a lot of positivity on that issue. I don't want to, you know, put any cynicism into it at this moment while there seems to be some traction. But I do have some, you know, lingering concerns about some broader structural issues that have been touched upon both by DG Ellard and uh, by, by, by Simon and Yuka. And that is, can we progress at the WTO in the current structure, <clears throat> whether we're talking about the DSB or we're talking about a single undertaking or we're talking about the consensus or we're talking about plurilateral deals on an MFN basis. And I think that these are real issues that need to be addressed, particularly the plurilateral issue. We see that more and more, this is the format that not just negotiations are taking, but also the discussions that are preconditioned to those negotiations. And there is a free rider problem that needs to be addressed. And I think that we've got to really sort of think through, you know, how we approach these issues, how we bring WTO membership along so that, you know, a plurilateral can be done within the WTO in a way that actually gets to the outcome that's desired. So some great points put on the table. Simon, maybe I can turn to you, just um, start it off on the pandemic. I mean, during the, the um, early days of the pandemic, you and your institute were instrumental in cataloging the growing export restrictions and other kind of trade facilitation restrictions that members were putting on their exports of COVID-related um, equipment, medicine, PPE, et cetera. Um, I assume you're still tracking that. Angela seemed to suggest that um, those measures are, you know, some are being lifted. Um, these were always intended, in my understanding, to kind of be temporary and proportional. Um, where, where, where does trade stand in, you know, with respect to pandemic-related um, equipment and medicines? So in medicines, the situation is, is this, that at the moment, there are still 141 export curbs on medical goods, which are in effect. That number has been flat for pretty much a year. So we've seen, so every time one has been expired, another one has popped up in its place. By the same government? Or... Not necessarily okay. by the same government. So that's been flat, which is bad news. Um, what was good news at the beginning of the start of the pandemic was over, there were over 200 liberalizing measures on terms of trade in medical goods. The bad news recently is about 30, 35 of those liberalizing measures were unwound at the beginning of the year, so they expired. And this very, this very quiet move is a restrictive uh, policy there. And I think this goes to Angela's point, the Walker process was the opportunity to try and lock in 
a lot of that liberalization uh, and, and get governments to at least commit to review the export curbs that they put in place so that temporary means temporary. Um, and that's really, uh, I hope that issue gets taken up again in 2022, but that still seems to me to be one way we can make progress. But do you think it's realistic to have um, an outcome on a pandemic response without um, an accompanied agreement on, on, trip, on the TRIPS waiver? The, um, no, the, that will be difficult. I think what I would say on the TRIPS waiver is uh, that uh, such is the expectation about the production of vaccines in this year, that even the World Health Organization and others are, are talking about the issue becoming not about the lack of, lack of production, but actually the distribution of vaccines. So I think uh, the, the, the salience of the TRIPS waiver issue as a, as a way of boosting production, this is going to diminish this year as the world uh, produces one and a half to two billion vaccines a month. So that might change the dynamic as well, but it has become a flashpoint, as you well know. Yeah, of course. Um, maybe we can turn um, briefly to the recent report that you issued on subsidies. Um, I was um, really stunned by your results um, in that um, I think you, I mean, you can remind me of the number, but there were what, thousands or, or over a thousand subsidies that you identified, and um, not only subsidies that have been applied by China, but the US, the EU and China all seem to be kind of in the game big time. Um, can you share with us kind of what you found and, and what, how does this, um, how could this figure into the WTO trying to, uh, you know, cope or address this emerging um, issue of concern? and really distortion for, for the international trading system. Sure, so <clears throat> what we did was to try and find as much information from official sources on subsidies awarded by the uh, Chinese, the EU and the United States. So you didn't rely on WTO notifications? We didn't, we didn't do anything on notifications. <laughs> okay. we, we actually dug into the details of what governments publish or what firms declare in terms of the subsidies they've received. We documented since the global financial crisis over 18,000 of them uh, in the three jurisdictions. Each jurisdiction had issued and awarded at least 5,000 subsidies. 18,000 uh, total? In total. So okay. this, and this data trove is available on the, on the web, on the Global Trade Alert website, and people are downloading it like crazy from what I can see. Um, now, uh, this uh, we then scaled, uh, mapped out how much trade is covered by all of these subsidies. We estimate conservatively that these three jurisdictions subsidies cover about 62% of world trade. When you take account of export incentives and inducements, not just subsidies to import competing firms. So this is a, a global problem and it's a problem that each of the three jurisdictions have. This point I think is important because it helps us shift the discussion about just pointing the finger at China, a strategy which I would argue has not really helped bring the Chinese to the table, uh, to one where maybe we can have a bit of a balanced discussion about how we can uh, take the edge off the subsidy problem that all three jurisdictions have. And it's my understanding, and Angela intimated as much as well, she's picked up on the same things that I have, that uh, there is more and more interest in Geneva on what could probably be called an informal policy dialogue, talks about talks. Uh, and that really does need to be evidence driven. And we intend on continuing to contribute to that. And China seems to be showing signs of maybe being more open to these discussions. Um, I know just, um, you know, Xi Jinping at the recent Shanghai Import Expo, um, ex Import Expo talking about how China would be open to negotiations on state-owned enterprises and subsidies. Um, is, is that a correct assessment, do you think? I think I think there is an ass the correct assessment there. There's certainly a signal of a change in willingness to talk, I think, from uh, from Beijing. The question then is, what does that amount to in what form? This is the, the need for the talks yeah. about talks, which I which I mentioned. But I do think it's different. And, and the other um, change which has happened, uh, uh, Wendy, which uh, which I've seen in talking to governments is there's sort of a recognition that the old trilateral process had run out of steam. It wasn't delivering. So we needed a new formulation. So maybe these two things have come at the right time or at least conveniently timed. 
Okay. Yuka, if I can turn to you, you were um, talking about the e-commerce negotiations and how important they are and kind of the need maybe to for countries to be more flexible and pragmatic and realistic. Um, I was wondering if you could delve more into that, particularly with respect to the issue of data, the use, application, and storage of data, where there seems to be huge gaps, you know, between the different countries. Um, I mean, do you think realistically common ground can be found in that area? Well, I think first of all, uh, digital trade, the digital economy is sort of um infrastructure for the current trade and not only developed WTO members, but also developing WTO members can benefit from the uh, development of digital trade. So it's not just for developed countries, but of course, as you mentioned, domestic regulations are highly diverse and countries are taking different um, positions on um, contentious issues. Um, I think, but some um, e-commerce negotiation, negotiation participating countries such as New Zealand, Australia, Singapore, those countries have developed um, some um, digital trade agreements outside the WTO. That kind of experience could um, educate other participating members and that could help WTO members forge um, conversions on highly contentious matters. But I think I'm not uh, truly optimistic about the prospect of the um, uh, negotiations on those highly contentious issues. So as I mentioned earlier, I think at some point, probably um, members have to be a little less um, ambitious and they should sort of separate less contentious issues from contentious issues and may have to choose to agree on just less contentious issues and in a way give up on more contentious issues. And I think, um, as you know, uh, New Zealand and um, um, Singapore um, has taken a modular approach when they adopted um, digital, uh, digital economy partnership agreement. And that modular approach sort of gives flexibility to um, digital trade negotiations. And that experience can be used in the WTO context as well. But just to follow up on that, um, you mentioned the regional, you know, the, the DEPA um, and China now and, and Korea are interested in joining. Um, so this may become a regional agreement with more and more members. Um, do you think if the WTO really can't deal with some of the controversial issues, then the message is, well, maybe countries then need to kind of find a different group outside of the WTO to work, you know, to work on the issues. Um, well, as I said, I think it's uh, really uh, difficult and probably uh, very challenging. But I think um, concern lies with China and we are very concerned about data so sovereignty, data authoritarianism. And to address those issues, we have to have certain provisions, certain disciplines within the WTO. So um, although I agree that it's very difficult, it's challenging, but I think we members have to keep um, trying to reach an agreement um, within the WTO. And just one more question there. It seems that, pro that the progress has been made in the WTO e-commerce negotiations, but and a lot of that progress is what I would call on trade facilitation provisions dealing with the e invoicing, e-signature, e-payment, et cetera. Um, do, do you think that WTO members should think about maybe having a, a more limited, you know, a limited outcome and harvesting some of the progress that they've made and putting those provisions in place and then kind of moving to the more contentious issues? I know there's always a debate on that because, you know, if you harvest the easier stuff, what's the incentive to, you know, to work on the, the tougher stuff? But how do, how do, how do you view um, such an outcome? Well, I think um, digital trade is changing very rapidly. And if members take too much time to agree on a fixed agreement, that takes too much time. So I think by nature, an agreement, any agreement on, on digital trade has to be flexible, has to be a living agreement. So that means that members should consider agreeing on certain provisions rather than agreeing on the whole package of a digital trade agreement. So actually, um, in relation to this, Sarah earlier mentioned about 
uh, we have to review the, um, the um, structure of WTO talks. And in the past, in the WTO talks, um, members are focusing on agreeing on binding roles and they're focusing on a package of agreement on certain issues. But I think that sort of inflexible approach makes it very difficult for them to reach an agreement on any issues. So I think they have to be more flexible. They have to be, um, I mean, flexible. They have to consider um, approaching issues on an incremental basis rather than on, in a single package. Sarah, if I can turn to you, um, and maybe you can share with us what's going on with respect to the environmental and climate issues in Geneva. There seems to be some new initiatives on the table, including a group of countries putting forward an, a new initiative. You can explain um, what it is. Um, but also, when you look you know, at the coming year, do you think there's a real opportunity for the WTO to make progress in this area? Because for me, it's like the pandemic and digital. If the WTO can't move in these areas, it's almost, you know, it, it will become increasingly irrelevant. Over to you, Sarah. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Wendy. I mean, we are really at a, a, a crisis point when it comes to climate change, and the WTO is pretty woefully behind in, in its work. Um, I think that the uh, recent, uh, it's, it's called the Trade and Environment Sustainability Structure Discussions, um, and the acronym is TESD, uh, notwithstanding, you know, the mouthful that is. Um, this was set up by a, a, a group of countries, again, a, a plurilateral group, so it doesn't include everybody, but it has a lot of notable members, including the full roster uh, of countries that participated in the environmental goods agreement negotiations, uh, you know, some, some years ago. So I think that this group, uh, intends to try and take some of these issues head on and to come up with an action plan for discussions and for concrete deliverables on a range of issues. And I, I am very encouraged by this. I think that there's a lot of work to be done though, and there are some challenges as well. Um, so what we have, uh, what we have from the testee most recently in November is a set of three ministerial declarations. And again, these are all plurilateral declarations with different subsets of countries that have joined on. But I think the fact that those declarations were finalized, even as the ministerial conference was delayed, shows that there is positive and forward momentum. So one of them is on trade and environmental sustainability. This is pretty broad based. It includes issues such as how to facilitate trade and environmental goods, how to achieve a circular economy, how to uh, look at the trade and environmental impacts of different types of subsidies. So it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty comprehensive. Another of the declarations is on fossil fuel subsidy reform. Um, and then there is a, a last declaration on plastics pollution and environmentally sustainable plastics trade. So, you know, on the opportunity side of the ledger, this is a chance to really move the ball forward on issues that are critical, that are trade, that have a, you know, obvious trade nexus and um, that, that need action immediately. On the challenges side, um, we've got to figure out how to um, find that right balance where this group of like-minded countries can achieve enough progress to incentivize other members to join, but without having other members join whose sole purpose is to slow roll any ambition or to tank the ambition. So that's going to be a challenge, um, but I think again, that there's a lot of opportunities as well. Can you just explain you know, this notion of declarations versus like an actual binding WTO agreement. Like, do you think this is um, going to be a new kind of operating procedure for the WTO? Maybe. I think that um, in my own experience, I think a declaration is a signal of political will. 
And so I think that that is basically tantamount to an instruction to capitals that we need to move, move the ball forward on, on issues, even if it's not binding or enforceable. Um, I think that where there is a will, there is a way. And so I think that there is a path that the testee has carved out here with these declarations. If you think about um, on the circular economy, for example, a lot of countries are talking about a circular economy. This is coming up in other multilateral environmental agreements. Um, and yet what we're really talking about here when we're talking about a circular economy is a reverse supply chain. It's about trade and the WTO has been absent from those discussions. We need to get the WTO involved, get the membership to be thinking about how this can be defined, how we can find a path forward to commoditize, you know, recyclable materials to get them, you know, to get them into trade. And that's also going to be driving outcomes on the climate. Um, I think that there's also some 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 opportunities through this declaration to start grappling with the environmental goods discussions again, which which fell apart in in 2016. But a lot of great work had been done um, up until that point. We're now six years past that. An up an updated, modernized view of what an environmental good is should be you know one area that this, that this uh, platform can flush out. And we should be looking in particular at, you know, not just what is an environmental good, but what is an environmental good in a trade context? How will the liberalization of trade actually lead to a greater deployment of that particular good or technology? So these are the types of things that the ministers have, um, have set up in the declaration, and I think it's a it's 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 ripe for action. Um, and maybe I could. It seems these days you can't talk about the environment and trade without talking about CBAMs, carbon border adjustment mechanisms. As we all know, the EU is going um, straight ahead um, with its own um, you know its own policies. Um, I, we know you know Ngozi has kind of expressed some caution and concern that the EU is kind of out of step with other members. And she's kind of urged kind of a broader effort to arrive at an appropriate global um, carbon pricing involving the WTO and even other international organizations. Is that realistic? Not in the short term, in my view, with all due respect to the DG. I think that she's trying to head off a series of unilateral measures that will create a potential retaliation or trade wars or new disputes, and she's not wrong in that intention. Um, on the other hand, I think if you look at the playing field as it is today, um, as of April 1st, 2021, there was one regional, 56 national, and 42 subnational carbon pricing mechanisms that are in use, scheduled, or under consideration around the world. They are not harmonized. The prices are all over the map. So there is a lot of work that needs to be done at a threshold level to understand what are we talking about here when we're talking about a carbon border adjustment mechanism? What are we talking about when we're talking about carbon accounting and measuring the carbon content of a product? How are we doing that? Are we doing that by sector, by entity, at a product label level? There is a lot of very complex technical questions that are going to go into this. I think unilateral moves um, could be quite short-sighted. Um, I would rather see, and we're doing a lot of work on this at Silverado, a like-minded group of countries that has high environmental standards and high environmental compliance come together and think through how to, how to make a blueprint um, that's going to give way to a broader plurilateral multilateral initiative down the line. And a key part of that is also going to be figuring out not just the carrots, but also how to incentivize the climate laggards to have better behavior. And finally, and most critically, how to um, allow developing countries to climb the ladder. 
they need a better way to um, adopt environmental technologies that are going to help them to meet their climate commitments. So there's a lot of work to be done. I don't see a multilateral solution in the short run, but I do think that the WTO can play a role in bringing together these ideas so that we're not uh, all just taking aim at one another um, with unintended consequences. One last question then for the panel, I'm going to move away from substance and more into process. Um, the WTO just seems to be reluctant or handicapped in terms of moving their work to more of a virtual setting, while other international organizations just seem more poised and, and able to do so. Um, is it time for the WTO to really think of new ways to work? Angela, you know, suggested that there is thinking on this going on. If you can't get all the ministers together in person, you know, maybe you bring small groups of ministers together virtually, for example. But, um, you know, a lot of people will say, well, you know, the WTO negotiates. We all know about negotiations. You can't close the negotiation unless they're in-person meetings. But we're in a new world now, and I would just like to close with um, if any of our speakers want to kind of comment on where we're going and, you know, it is, are there ways, to, do we all need to be more creative about trying to use the virtual settings to allow for negotiations or other configurations besides an in-person ministerial to make progress? So I can go in the... Um, Simon, maybe I can turn to you first. You've probably given some thought to it and seen this firsthand in Geneva. Yeah, I mean, I, you're absolutely right. There needs to be a lot of thinking here, but uh, a new thinking here on how to work together. But coming at a time when you've had a decade of sort of growing distrust between lots of the members of the WTO, um, essentially the switch to online or digital or virtual meetings, it can be just used as an excuse not to cooperate. So I think um, we probably can't detach the decision on how to work together from the decision of whether we want to work together. No, that's, I'm not sure that's really uplifting, but thank you. <laughs> Yuka, any thoughts on, on that question? Well, as I said earlier, um, well, they're negotiating digital trade, but they're not using digital trade. So that's really um, weird to me. And um, um, I understand the uneasiness that governments may have with respect to um, negotiations virtually, but um, well, maybe one way to go, maybe to use more informal um, declarations, as Sarah said, and governments may hesitate to um, make binding decisions virtually, but they may make non-binding declarations virtually. And another way to go, maybe to use experts I think government and uh, WTO members focus too, mu too much on member to member, government to gov government talks, and that might require in-person talks. But using by using um, technical experts, for example, um, Simon provided us a very um, interesting study, and that kind of study should be used in the WTO talks. I'm really, I think it's really pro problematic, for example, in the TRIPS uh, waiver negotiation, members are talking about political issues, but they did not see the reality of TRIPS waiver, the reality of vaccine vaccine access and vaccine distribution. They have to analyze um, the reality by probably using technical experts. And that kind of process can be done virtually. So there are many ways to use um, technologies. And Sarah, last word. <laughs> I would just say we've come a long way from, you know, 10 years ago when we would have to build in a couple of hours of technology time to all of our DVCs when we were trying to work virtually with our foreign counterparts. I think that a lot more work can be done uh, through technology, and I think that that's a blessing. I also think that you cannot put a price on developing personal in-person relationships and looking somebody in the eye. So I do hope that even if we do a lot more uh, with technology, that you know we don't let that in-person uh, piece of the equation uh, you know go away completely, because that is, in my opinion, how we really do end up uh, in the end game. 
Well, thanks to our panel, Simon, Yuka, and Sarah, and thanks to Deputy Director General of the WTO, Angela Ellard. I think we've had a great discussion both on substance and process. And, you know, I would just conclude and say I'm more optimistic about the WTO than I was before this webinar, which is not to say they're not enormous challenges um, on the horizon, um, but maybe we can reconvene a year from now and, and talk about what was accomplished um, and see if, if we were right with some of our expectations and predictions. Thanks to our viewers. Appreciate you staying with us for the full program. Have a great day, great evening, great morning, depending where you are. Take care, everyone. Thanks, Stay Wendy. healthy.